Welcome to another edition of Horse Center, everyone. I am Brian Zipsy, and as always, I have the excellent pleasure of being joined by my co-host to the East Coast, that's Matt Shipman. How are you today, Matt? I am good, Brian. The pleasure is all mine. We're post-triple crown, finally, but we're not going to forget about the three-year-olds. No, I think we have to talk about what went down June 5, Saturday, June 5 at Belmont Park, Matt, because it was a big day, a big weekend, lots of big performances. I can't stop saying the word big, Matt, but hey, I thought the Belmont, correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought the Belmont might have been a three-year-old division kind of defining race as we saw essential quality and hot rod Charlie leave the rest behind. I think, Brian, certainly up to this point, this it, the results were... Uh, division uh, defining, as you say, but I think very clearly um, as they turned for home, we saw that there were really only two horses who were going to get the mile and a half distance. Right. The mile and a half is a demanding distance that they never ran before. They'll likely never run again. I thought the best two horses uh, proved themselves in the last, well, I don't know, half mile that Belmont stakes, but for essential quality, hey, Matt, he's six out of seven lifetime. I think it's time for everyone to, to really say essential quality is the leader of this division. I think there's no doubt about it. Everyone liked the race that Hot Rod Charlie ran in this Belmont, running very fast early and staying there for as long as he did. But for my money, essential quality, again, six of seven, five graded stakes winners, two wins, two-year-old champion, his only loss was a pretty wide trip after a little bit of a rough start in the Kentucky Derby. He's my number one, and I think the Belmont kind of was his re, if you will, re coming out party. Yeah, I agree with that, Brian. And, and it has been so extremely rare that uh, the two-year-old champion continues on. And, and at this point, uh, if we had to vote, would be the three-year-old champion. Um, he did everything right uh, in the Belmont Stakes, got to 12 furlong distance. Hot Rod Charlie, too, did everything right in there, got out, set the pace. Um, like I had said before the show, I didn't expect Rock Your World to be on the lead. Uh, uh, Hot Rod Charlie took, uh, took control of the race, but just, you know, but just couldn't hang on down the stretch, but uh, deserves everybody's credit. Yeah, absolutely. It's hard to believe Hot Rod Charlie is still a winner of only two races. Of course, one of those races was a big win in the Million Dollar Louisiana Derby, but Hot Rod Charlie ran a really, really good race this Belmont. Now, at the final time, 227 and change, that's one of the fastest Belmonts we've seen in a long time. I know the track was fast, but it wasn't one of those blistering track record every kind of race time. So what these two horses did and leaving uh, the third horse and everybody else, uh, 11, 12, and more lengths behind, I was very impressed. Yeah, and, and no question, Brian, the track was really wasn't playing uh, particularly fast. It was just uh, uh, two really good performances from two uh, three-year-olds getting that mile and a half distance. That doesn't mean when they cut back now to uh, races that are a mile and an eighth, mile and a quarter at the most, when we're talking about the uh, the Travers uh, possibly at Saratoga doesn't mean that some of these other horses aren't going to come back into play. Oh, absolutely. There's, there's some good three-year-olds out there and there's some good three-year-olds that haven't uh, yet dipped their toes into the very top racing, like the triple crown races. So we have a lot to look forward to this summer. Uh, early word is essential quality will probably be pointed towards that Travers at Saratoga. Hot Rod Charlie might be pointed to try older horses in the Pacific Classic at Del Mar. Speaking of older horses, Matt, uh, let's just touch on some of these other big performances over the weekend, especially on Saturday. I thought domestic spending made a big statement on the turf in the Manhattan. Yeah, Brian, and you talked about uh, essential quality as a horse that's only lost one race. We could say the same thing about uh, the domestic spending, who has also only lost one race. His last three victories have come in grade ones um, in the Manhattan as Chad Brown was winning his seventh Manhattan. And I think that's like seven wins in the last decade. So uh, uh, Chad has a stranglehold on this race, but domestic spending clearly stamped himself as the top older 
male turf horse, maybe uh, for Colonel Liam. Um, he had put together too many races in a row um, and we'll need a little, little bit of a break now. Yeah, domestic spending, I, I, I just think there's no one in the turf world in America, at least, that can touch domestic spending right now. Identical record, lifetime record of essential quality, Matt, six for seven lifetime. The son of Kingman, you know, in retrospect, it looked like that old, that turf classic, the old Forrester turf classic or grade one race on Derby Day where domestic spending came flying to get the dead heat with Colonel Liam was just a... Uh, 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 holding off of the in inevitable, if you will, because domestic spending, what we saw in this Manhattan was uh, pure domination. Chad Brown's had a lot of very good turf horses in the last 10 years or so, but this one looks like he could be right there up with any of them. That's how impressive he looked in winning the Manhattan 159 in change for that mile and a quarter on turf. Who else, Matt? Latruska. Uh, Silver State, two more big performances that kind of put them right there at the top of their respective divisions as well. Yeah, uh, Latruska in the Phipps was a clear winner, looked like a winner every step of the way. Of course, the field didn't play out to be as strong as we had expected, you know, a few days before the race. But still, that's the kind of performance uh, that you, you want to see from a horse that is going to be called the top horse in the division, which is what we have to say about Latruska. Right, and, and excuses aside, you know, Monomoy girls on the shelf, Swiss Skydiver missed this race, which was kind of a bummer, uh, but excuses aside, Latruska is clearly the leader of the division for now. Uh, we'll see if Monomoy girl and Swiss Skydiver can come back to their best soon, but for now, Latruska leads that older, female division. And Matt, I'll tell you what, I, I know there's a lot of good candidates for this division, a wide open division and the older males on the dirt. But right now, I don't think any, any horse has done more than Silver State has done in 2021. Yeah, I agree with that, Brian. You're, as you're saying, maybe Silver State right now is the leader of the older male uh, dirt division as he now has won six races in a row, uh, uh, winning, stepping up to win the grade one Met Mile, uh, trained by Steve Asmussen, who talk about a trainer that's got a stranglehold in the race, as we mentioned with Chad Brown. Uh, Asmussen's got a stranglehold on the Met Mile, having won three out of the last four. That, that, that is really a spectacular training uh, job. Yeah, yeah, and, and probably a spectacular training job with this horse who uh, wasn't quite getting there on the Kentucky Derby Trail last year. Maybe he had a little physical setback. Uh, but uh, since he's come back six for six, two of whom came in impressive uh, allowance fashion last year in Kentucky, but he's four for four this year, coming off big wins in the Oklahoma handicap and the Met Mile. It's time for Phil Silver State to finally get the dis uh, respect that he deserves. All right, Matt, that's our uh, quick review of what uh, happened. A lot of other big performances, but that's our review on the Belmont Stakes Day. I hope you enjoyed it, folks. I uh, hope it was a successful uh, uh, betting endeavor for you as well. I want to remind you, please subscribe to our YouTube channel here at Horse Racing Nation. We really do appreciate it. Turn those notifications on to make sure you never miss another Horse Center going forward. Matt, I want to bring things down the uh, East Coast there just a little bit to the Jersey Shore, closer to your home, my friend. And uh, let's talk about Monmouth Park. Now, Monmouth Park has uh, been open just about two weeks. They've had about seven racing cards, and everybody's talking about the new whip rule there at Monmouth. What do you think about this? Well, Brian, you know, uh, the, the rule is that the jockeys are not allowed to use the whip for purposes of urging uh, horses to perform better. They are only allowed to use it in cases of safety. Uh, and that determination is made by the stewards uh, after the race. Uh, I'll be frank with you, Brian. I have not uh, had the opportunity to watch too many of those races. Um, the thing that at this point is really obvious and concerns me the most is the negative effect that that rule has had on the handle at Monmouth Park. Almost virtually every racetrack across the country at this point of the year is showing very significant increases in handle, but Monmouth Park is showing an extreme decrease in their handle. Yes, 
they have had bad weather in almost every one of those days, racing days that you mentioned. But even on the nice racing days, their handle is down a lot. So for me, uh, uh, that's a really sad situation, a sad effect for Monmouth Park, which did not make this rule, did not ask for this rule, a rule that was invoked by the New Jersey Racing Commission. Yeah, and the New Jersey Racing Commission is the first to really take a stand here. Bottom line for me, Matt, is I, I think it's all about PR. I think it's public relations and horse racing needs for, for good or for bad, it needs to pay attention to public relations now at a point where it's uh, maybe struggling more than it ever has as a sport. So PR is important, but uh, this will, you know, it, it, it's, you're talking about handle, the jockeys had a lot to say about it. I know John Velasquez has been very vocal in his uh, disapproval of what Monmouth Park is doing. Uh, we don't want to see any uh, horses hurt or jockeys, of course, hurt because the jockeys aren't allowed to do what they feel like they need to do to be necessary to be as safe as possible. I am always been one for animal welfare, but I, I think this course of action is a little extreme. I think there's ways to make uh, the whip um, uh, less of a, uh, a, a negative thing in racing. I, I, I Again, I, I really think it's all about optics and, and how it looks to the general public that knows very little about horses and very little about what a whip really does to horses. So from my standpoint, uh, I'm kind of with the jockeys. Uh, it, it's, it, it's good in a way to see Monmouth Park or, or the New Jersey Racing Commission be proactive and try to uh, step up for the good of the overall sport, but I really don't think this is the answer. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Brian. You know, the, the, the whips that they use now, the, the part of the whip that contacts the horse is basically like, uh, like a Nerf ball, uh, uh, like a Nerf, uh, a Nerf pellet, if you guys have ever played with those toys. Um, so, uh, but uh, it, it, that's where they are in New Jersey at Monmouth Park and uh, another hurdle that Monmouth Park has got to jump over. Yeah. And speaking of handle, Matt, it'll be interesting to see because this is really their first big weekend. This, in fact, we've identified it as the biggest, uh, uh, biggest site for uh, big races this weekend. The two races we're about to talk about are both happening at Monmouth Park. Let's let's go to Sunday first, if you will. It's not a great at stakes, but the Pegasus has become the major prep for the Haskell. A lot of horses transitioning from the Triple Crown. Uh, who don't want to take too much time off before the Haskell come to the Pegasus. And that is very true for the horse that we expect to be eventually, officially declared the Kentucky Derby winner, Matt. That's Mandaloon making his first start since a very game second place, per fin uh, place finish in the Kentucky Derby. Yeah, Brian, it is certainly a very, very high profile horse to have in the Pegasus. Of course, uh, Maximum Security ran in the race a couple of years ago. Um, but uh, Mandaloon, uh, trained by Brad Cox, uh, uh, took a break after the Derby, I think maybe to allow uh, Central Quality to have the spotlight uh, uh, in uh, Belmont Stakes, but prepping for the Haskell, and he's shipping up to Mom Park today in preparation for that million dollar race, uh, one of the remaining grade ones for three-year-olds. Yeah, and this is a horse who's been very consistent in his career, save one race. That was the Louisiana Derby, the race before the Kentucky Derby, which made him a long shot for the Kentucky Derby. But he came right back to running with that big second in the Kentucky Derby. We're expecting eventually Medina Spirit to be disqualified, officially disqualified from the win, which would move Mandaloon to the Kentucky Derby winning spot. Uh, I always think it's difficult for a horse to come back from a mile and a quarter race, jump back to a mile and 16th race, especially in a race that's just a prep. I, I think he's probably going to be in the neighborhood of two to five, three to five in here, Matt. For me, it's worth a shot to take against, uh, to take a shot against such a heavy favorite in here. So let's talk about some of the other horses in the race. Let's start with Dr. Jack. I think he'll be the second choice trained by Todd Pletcher. Matt, he's two for two. He did one sprint down in Florida and one uh, stretch out at Pimlico. 
Yeah, Brian, and my, you know, initially I had that same reaction about this race as you do, just questioning whether Brad Cox would have Mandaluna at 100% in here and whether he needed to be 100%. It's worth noting that Dr. Jack in this horse of field is the only horse with recency in his past performances. Um, a start in April, a start in May. Everybody else in the field is coming off of significant layoffs. And, and so, you know, I got to keep that in mind also when I think about whether I'm going to use or try and beat Mandaloon or not. Yeah, Dr. Jack, uh, Dr. Jack will be the second choice. I agree with you to a point, Matt, that the, the thing that I might not agree with is I just don't feel like there's a lot of impetus to be sharp for this race. And a lot of times horses naturally are not sharp coming out of a mile and a quarter, dropping down in distance quite a bit. Dr. Jack looked good in a maiden sprint at Gulfstream Park in an allowance win over Preakness weekend at Pimlico. Uh, but of course he's moving way up in the class. So this will be a stake debut. Uh, so I, I, another horse who probably will get a lot of money. I think he's gonna be the clear second choice in here. But an interesting horse, a horse maybe to look out for as the uh, as the summer three-year-old season winds up. A horse who I do like a lot and is another one of those horses, Matt, as you say, who hasn't been around a lot, but Weyburn. Weyburn was the winner of the Gotham. And if you look at the Gotham, sometimes I like speed horses that haven't raced recently. I think they can be extra sharp when they return. So Weyburn didn't try the long distances of the Triple Crown. He won the Gotham off a layoff. He ran in the Wood Memorial. He was not at the best part of the track. He stuck around pretty well, even though it was a great addition of the Wood Memorial. He stuck around pretty well. I don't think it was a bad effort at all. Now he's been freshened again. It's been a couple months. I think Weyburn is going to run a race here in this Pegasus. Could very well do that, but certainly he's a horse who uh, it's hard to know what is actually going to happen when he's on the racetrack since that performance in the wood and in in shows that we've done since the wood we've been pretty clear about you know uh, uh the quality of the field in the wood uh, not being strong and then looking at the performance of horses that you know beat Weyburn in that race again uh affirming that since the wood it's been one thing after another little little kinds of things uh uh, going wrong with Weyburn. Um, could he win the race? Absolutely. Um, is he going to be at a hand for hundred percent? I don't know, but uh, we'll see. Yeah. Again, I like fresh speed horses. He is a speed horse. The Wood Memorial, he uh, was never able to uh, get an easy lead in, in, in there. He had pressure the whole way on a part of the racetrack that I didn't particularly like. And if you look at how the wood unfolded, it was the horses coming from well back that, that actually did well. So I thought the, the, the fourth place finish in the wood was actually a good race for Weyburn. I like him on the, uh, the two months off. Another horse coming off a layoff is Brooklyn Strong. He's only had two races. I don't think he got a great trip in either the wood or the Kentucky Derby, but on the other hand, he really didn't uh, show a whole lot in either one. He didn't. Things haven't gone uh, as planned for Brooklyn Strong after a fantastic uh, year as a two-year-old where everything seemed to go just right for Brooklyn Strong. Um, I'm not quite sure uh, why we should expect Brooklyn Strong to uh, uh, make a big turnaround in this race, particularly even though it's a field of five, uh, it, it's a good field of five. It's a good field of five. I'll tell you what I do like. I, as I said, I don't think he had great trips in his first two starts of the year, which were obviously two tough places to, to, to begin his three-year-old season. I uh, should get a much better trip here because he's the only rallier in the race. Five-horse field, he's the only rallier. You got to give an extra look to a horse like that. Maybe if he gets a good trip with a good pace, I think Brooklyn Strong could make some noise in here, but he needs to improve off those first two performances. Last horse in the field, Matt, is Legamo. Wagamo hasn't been seen since he finished 12th. Uh, I believe it was over 30 lengths back in the UAE Derby back in March. Yeah, curious kind of horse who is now racing for your friend, Antonio Sano, who we, who we remember as the trainer of the $5 million winning Gunavera uh, not too many years ago. Uh, this horse began his career in Maryland, did really well. Uh, Won a couple races, was third in a stakes race um, in Maryland, and uh, 
after that changed hands and is in the barn of, uh, of Santa who decided that his first race would be shipping across the world to the UE, UAE Derby. That didn't go particularly well. It's been a couple of months now. Um, and now Sanal decides to ship from Florida all the way up to New Jersey uh, in preparation for this race. Um, obviously don't know what to expect, but um, I don't know, curious kind of horse here. Yeah, he's the big long shot in the field, Matt, and I just can't recommend him off of uh, that long trip to the UAE Derby where he really didn't show much at all. Uh, probably a prep for other things, but he found a difficult place to prep. All right, Matt, that's, uh, that's a quick look at the Pegasus here on Sunday, mile 16th at Monmouth Park. Who's your top pick? Who's your top long shot? I'm going to go with Mandaloon. I just, you know, I just feel like he doesn't even, he doesn't need to be a hundred percent to win this race. Um, so I'm going to go with Mandaloon and Hey, I'm going with, uh, with, I'm taking it literally Brian for my long shot. I am going with the long shot Lugamo. Okay. Yeah. I can't get behind Lugamo here, Matt. I am going to try to beat the favorite though. Like I said, two to five, three to five doesn't really interest me. Yeah. If he runs near his best mandaloon will win this, but I think Waybird is a horse still underrated. I like his races uh, to close last year. And then obviously the Gotham where he'd be two good horses in crowded tail and highly motivated from the Chad Brown barn. Then, like I said, I think that wood Memorial is better than it looks on paper. I'm going to, I'm going to go with Waybird. I'm hoping he's uh, five to one or more as a, as a clear third choice in here to win the Pegasus outright. My long shot will be Brooklyn Strong. I think there's only two long shots in here. Brooklyn Strong, I said, is the lone rallier. Maybe he can clunk up for the, uh, the exacta. All right, Matt, let's uh, change gears here. We'll go to the older horses a day before. It's race 10 on Saturday at Monmouth Park. It's the one mile Salvatore mile grade three and I think it's a nice little field of 10 here Matt led by New York traffic. It's a it's a competitive field of 10. Uh, in my opinion, a lot of horses who uh, have some decent races as of late quite a quite a spread of uh, of horses in terms of their past performances and the kind of horses they've been been running against several horses who are familiar names who have who have changed trainers since we first got to know them um, but New York traffic for Safi Joseph who was second in the Haskell last year a lot of good performances last year as a two-year-old came back in an allowance race at Belmont Park to win by almost seven seven lengths um, it is 2021 debut for this. Um, Safi Joseph is going great guns at Belmont Park. We know this horse likes this race. Um, Going to be a worthy favorite. Yeah, I think he's a worthy favorite too, Matt. And I think it's time for New York traffic to really step up this year as a four-year-old and show us that he is a great at stakes uh, caliber horse, a great at stakes winner. Obviously, he was great at stakes caliber last year because he finished uh, well in a lot of good races, especially earlier in the year, none better than his lone race at Monmouth Park where he missed by an eyelash from beating the Kentucky Derby winner authentic in last year's million dollar Haskell. If he returns to that kind of form, I think he will win this race and you got to like his prep when he returned at seven furlongs. It was against state breads at New York, maybe not a great field, but uh, he looked really good in winning his return race uh, uh, last month at uh, Belmont Park. Now, the horse who won this race last year, Matt, is Pirate's Punch. And speaking of horses that are underrated, I think Pirate's Punch fits into this category. Pirate's Punch did a lot of good things last year, did a lot of good things at Monmouth Park, where only a disqualification uh, uh, denied him two straight graded stakes wins here. Uh, but he hasn't been back. He had a little minor surgery to remove some chips after the Breeders' Cup Dirt Mile, and he hasn't run since. So few questions there for Pirates Punch. Yeah, I agree, Brian. Shipping up from Kentucky for trainer Grant Forrester for, uh, for this race. But, you know, if, if he can come back um, uh, in the kind of form that he showed last year with his affinity for uh, Monmouth Park, he needs to be uh, considered a contender. Yeah, a contender for sure if he runs back to last year because he was very good last year. New York Traffic Pirates punched two horses who ran very well 
at Monmouth Park last year. Next horse on our list, Matt, is West Will Power. And much like Dr. Jock, I think this is going to be a stakes horse. But I like him more than I like Dr. Jock in the Pegasus because West Will Power has already had five lifetime races for Trainer Kelly Breen. He's also two for two at Monmouth Park. Yeah, three career wins, as you mentioned, two of them coming at Monmouth Park. Um, he also had a big allowance victory uh, at Keeneland. And, you know, if you're talking about Monmouth Park uh, and, and you want a trainer to play, Kelly Breen, uh, um, locally based at Monmouth Park. I think he was the leading trainer at, at Monmouth last, uh, last summer since the demise of uh, Jorge Navarro. Um, makes uh, West Will Power a horse you definitely have to consider. Yeah, I think West Will Power uh, never been worse than first or second in five starts. I think West Will Power uh, is going to prove to be a stakes horse, and I think this is a good spot. I think he's the number one challenger, actually, for New York traffic in this spot, Matt. A couple others we should talk about. Maybe I'll group a couple together. Basin and Greenlight go after their two-year-old season. Maybe we expected big things uh maybe based it a little bit more last year than green light go two horses though that are kind of at a crossroads in their career do they sprint do they go two turns can they become graded stakes winners again yeah brian basin uh had a great two-year-old year for uh steve asmussen but uh he's now being trained by uh pletcher and green light go had a uh, also a great two-year-old year was second in the champagne when he was trained for Jimmy Jerkins. Greenlight goes now a four-year-old in the barn of uh, Jerry Hollendorfer. Yeah, and I think both of them still have the uh, uh, potential to pop up, maybe base in a little bit more than Greenlight go. I think I've, I've dropped my opinion on Greenlight go just a little bit more. Basin jumping up from some sprint races, so he should be involved early. Maybe he's the more too uh, dangerous of the two uh, that were graded stakes winners as two-year-olds. One, one other horse that I want to mention, Matt, and he's my super long shot in the race. His name is Galerio. Uh, coming from the barn of Dale Bennett in Maryland, Matt, I don't know if you uh, looked at this as closely as I did, but this horse has actually been first or second in 15 consecutive races. <laughs> That's consistency. You, that's consistency that you've got to like, Brian, uh, which maybe will push his price down a little bit. But Dale Bennett may be a name that uh, a lot of people don't recognize, but they should. He's a heck of a trainer with uh, Barnes all over the country where he just wins. Yeah. And this horse, I tell you what, if, if, if some of the horses in the race are not up to their very best, this is a horse who could step up in class. Uh, this is obviously his toughest race yet, but uh, he's done some pretty good things in stakes races at Maryland recently. I, I think he's got a shot, especially if he can rally just a little bit in here. Having said that, Matt, who's your top pick? Who's your top long shot in the Salvatore Mile? Top pick is going to be New York traffic because if his uh, comeback win in uh, that allowance race in New York is an indication of what is to come and he can move ahead even more. He's going to be hard to beat in this field of horses who kind of are filled with question marks. My long shot's not going to be a big, big long shot. It's that Kelly Breen horse that we talked about, West Will Power. I think this is a quality horse and Breen uh, is a quality trainer at the Jersey Shore. Well, I have good news and bad news for you, sir. The, uh, the, the good news is um, I, I feel like I've turned the corner and I'm back on a winning streak. The bad news is I, I'm exactly saying the same thing in here. Uh, Salvatore Mile, I've near traffic is the likely winner if he, if he can turn in something close to his best. I think he's the best horse in the race. And yeah, I think West Will Power is the most likely horse to give him a real challenge. Maybe he's the third choice in here. Maybe we get some odds from him uh, making his stake state view. But I'm with you. New York traffic, West Will Power are my two as well. All right, Matt, that's a wrap. That's a show, a shorter show than normal, folks. <laughs> but uh, uh, we, we always enjoy bringing you uh, uh, our uh, uh, thoughts on the latest races here at Horse Center. Let me get a parting shot from you, Matt, before we go. Yeah, Brian, and, and so much more ahead. It's going to be a great summer. 
um, Saratoga's opening, spectators are back. The demand for tickets uh, at Saratoga has been unprecedented in the sales. So uh, stay with Horse Center all summer long. And of course, I wanna thank our great producer, Tony Bada Bing for putting together the show. Well said, sir. I think uh, after the pandemic, we are, uh, we're going full force to a great summer. Del Mar out west, Saratoga, uh, uh, here in the East Coast. Uh, it's still a, uh, a few weeks away before those great tracks open, but we're looking forward to it. We're kind of uh, a, a leader in the post-pandemic racing, Matt, so we're uh, almost through this crisis. Thanks to Tony Bada Bing, as always, for his great production. Thanks to Candace Curtis for the race graphics. Thanks to our sponsor, Derby Wars. They're the best contest set out there. And folks, thanks for you watching every week. We'll be back right here on Horse Center with another great show next week. We'll see you then.